Excellency Ambassador Professor Chrissy Kaponda, the Ambassador of the Republic of Malawi. Uh, we're expecting a few more other ambassadors. We'll be able to introduce them later when they join us. Among the other dignitaries, um, Dr. Leopold Augusto Nkomo from the African Union, who represent the Southern Africa region. Also, welcome to Dr. Tichakunda Simbini from NEPAD, uh, and also Dr. Agri Ambali. We also have Mr. Nigel Green Evans from the Department of Trade and Industry uh, in South Africa. Uh, the opening session is divided into two. We will start with uh, welcome remarks uh, uh, from those who are on the podium now, after which we will then start uh, an opening plenary. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Professor Lechner Simbai. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer in charge of research at the Human Sciences Research Council. Without any further ado, I'm going to ask Professor Nanya Buramola, who is the Acting Executive Director of the Africa Institute of South Africa program in the HSSC, to give some welcome remarks. Thank you very much, um, Professor Simbai, for the welcome. Um, I would also like to extend a welcome to all present. You have come from afar and from near, but you are equally welcome. Your Excellencies, Ambassador of various African countries represented here, the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Department of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa, Representatives of development organizations attending this conference from across Africa, executive directors and colleagues of the HSRC and the Africa Institute of South Africa, members of the media, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, welcome to the eighth African Unity for Renaissance conference. We started with this conference a number of years ago, before the African Institute of South Africa joined the Human Sciences Research Council. And this, Afri this annual conference has been attended from scholars, eminent scholars from across Africa. So we are very proud to be able to continue this tradition and to welcome you all to this conference. The African Unity for Renaissance Conference is an annual event organized by the African, uh, sorry, the African Institute of South Africa in the HSRC. Under the sponsorship of the Department of Science and Technology, and we would like to thank the department for the support, and other institutional partners, such as the Thabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute, Chwane University of Technology, the International Council for Science Regional Office for South Africa, which is ICSU, and the Water Research Commission. And all of these supporters and sponsors will be having an opportunity to speak at the conference in the open plenary as well as in the various uh, sections of the program. And I'm sure that you all have a copy of the program with you. So we started eight years ago, as mentioned, as a platform for promoting Pan-Africanism and African unity the conference has focused on indigenous knowledge systems, African spirituality, and a redefinition of the African identity within an evolving environment of modernization and globalization. Over time, it has become clear that the African Unity Renaissance Conference needed to be repositioned into a platform for harnessing the intellectual capacity of the African continent to address pertaining issues to the quest to develop in this vein African unity in the sense of political unity 
that has evolved into diverse dimensions of achieving convergences in different aspects of our economy, social and developmental emancipation. Of course, we on the African continent are subject to the Sustainable Development Goals, and therefore the 17 goals need to guide what we do on the continent. So the conference has metamorphosized into establishing discourse on various aspects related to African development and socioeconomic development. We have been dealing with common trade tariffs, free trade, trade areas and aspirations to establish regional value chains and infrastructure that link our countries more closely together, thereby facilitating easy movement of goods, people and services. This new dimension has been well carved into our inter integration agenda. So we have moved to a point where we understand that we need to work together as Africa and we need to, in other words, have physical access to other African countries in terms of business, in terms of culture and tourism, and for that we need infrastructure. So that is one of the reasons why infrastructure has been seen as such an important development on the African continent. In the light of various dynamics, the African Unity for Renaissance Conference made itself relevant to the development paradigm of the conference by becoming a platform for harnessing the intellectual capacity of Africans to add value and provide the basis for evidence-based policy, formulation and implementation in to ensure outcomes and impact on the livelihoods of our people in Africa. The conference has therefore evolved in this manner over time. Hence the theme for this year's conference, which is accelerating industrialization in Africa, implications for job creation and poverty reduction. Of course, as with South Africa, the continent is suffering from the tri triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. So the conference 2018 is relevant to addressing the main policy challenges that Africa faces, poverty, inequality, and unemployment in their multi-dimensional phenomena. Within the African continent, Africa's ability to industrialize and afford us significant opportunity to address these developmental challenges, poverty, inequality, and unemployment. The immediate outcome of this conference will be an outcome statement tomorrow, which will consolidate and precipitate key policy highlights that should be brought to the attention of the African policymakers in addressing challenges that face our quest for industrialization. Hence, conference participants were carefully selected on the basis of their expertise and experience in the development space of the continent. It is our hope and expectation that at the end of this conference, some concrete recommendations would be made that could add value to the development efforts of policymakers on the continent. Of course, we need to consider the context in which this conference takes place, as well as some important elements that we need to focus on throughout the two days here. South Africa has the honor, and perhaps onerous honor, of being the chair of SADC, BRICS, and the Indian Ocean Rim Association this year. So we need to consider our roles within these various organizations. And especially in terms of SADC and BRICS, there is definitely a focus on industrialization and infrastructure development. The Indian Ocean Rim Association also creates a space to ensure the blue economy does benefit the peoples of Africa. And this would include the development of ports, shipping, tourism, and to ensure infrastructure that allows this to happen. We also need to consider the fact that we are now facing the fourth industrial revolution, if not that we are in it. Industrial manufacturing and Man and industrialization and manufacturing will not go away, however. We, pu we purely need, as the African continent, to prepare ourselves for the changes that are taking place and will take place in the near future. 
Yesterday, I read a media article of a study done by Yaki Salia from the Institute for Security Studies in which he emphasized that the fourth industrial revolution could have very positive in impacts for the African continent in terms of leapfrogging technology, as long as Africa is flexible and able to adapt to the fourth industrial re revolution. He predicts that if we do, by 2040, 200 million new jobs would have been created across the continent. I would also like to emphasize that we cannot forget about sustainability, not only because of the sustainability development goals, but because we want to ensure that we have a future that is protected for our generations to come. And therefore, when we speak about development, we do need to take into consideration the sustainability of that development across this beautiful country. Once again, I would like to thank you and hope that you enjoy the next three days with us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nanya Bolamule. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Crane Sudin, who is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Human Sciences Research Council. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Simba. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. I'd also like to say a very warm welcome to uh, a number of ambassadors, and we're really grateful that they uh, will be here uh, and are here this morning. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge them very quickly, please. Uh, so we'll be uh, honoured to... Uh, have present with us uh, this morning uh, the ambassadors Sali Omar of the, of the state of Eritrea, um, um, Shamsuddin Maju of the Union of the Comoros, Emmanuel Mwamba of the Republic of Zambia, uh, Professor Chrissy Kaponda, Republic of Malawi, who is here, um, uh, Mrs. Raka, Rakiatu um, Mayaki of Niger, Republic of Niger, uh, Vieko and Ngiwete. Uh, the High Commissioner, Republic of Namibia, um, Dr. Ahmed Musa Ibeto the, from the Nigerian uh, High Commission, uh, Mr. Edward Coffey uh, the uh, the, from the Embassy of the Republic of Ghana, and also Ambassador Jean uh, Kamal uh, from um, the uh, Kenyan High Commission. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge Lightness has done this already. Um, our colleagues from N NEPAD, uh, Don Dutoy from uh, DST, uh, colleagues from D DTI, uh, and uh, Dr. Kojo Busia from the United Nations Economic Commission uh, for, for Africa. Uh, Mr. Niraj Vij of the African Development Bank is also with us. So, really great to have you all here, uh, colleagues. So welcome again um, to the eighth edition of the Africa Unity uh, for, uh, for Renaissance Conference 2018. Uh, this conference is an annual event, as Narnia has uh, already said to you, which is organized by the uh, Africa Institute of South Africa in the HSRC uh, in collaboration with the Department of Science and, Te and Technology uh, and our long-standing institutional partners, such as the Tabo Mbeki Africa Leadership Institute, um, at UNISA, the Trani University of Technology, the International Council for Science, uh, Regional Office for Africa, and Daniel is here somewhere, uh, and the Water Research Commission. And we'd really like to also thank the Water Research Commission uh, for co-sponsoring this conference um, uh, along with us. The theme for this year's conference is Accelerating Industrialization in Africa, Implications for Job Creation and Poverty Reduction. Now, this theme was chosen for a number of reasons. First, South Africa, as Narnia has said to you, is the current chair of SADC, whose long-term development plan is focused on industrialization. The SADC Industrialization Strategy and Roadmap 2015 to 2063 outlines key thematic foci for the industrialization of the Southern African development community. These are, first of all, infrastructure development, and two, value chains development and value addition. Second, the theme speaks to accelerating, accelerating industrialization. Now this quest 
to industrialize is not new. And I can quite imagine that we will have a lot of debate around, all of, uh, 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 around that particular theme, around its appropriateness uh, and it, its, its relevance uh, right now. But as far as 50 to 60 years ago already, the leaders of our liberation struggle envisioned that the most sustainable pathway to Africa's development was to modernize our agricultural uh, sector, to industrialize and build the required human capacity with a strong focus on science, technology, and innovation. Third, Africa's quest to industrialize is not just for the sake of industrializing, but to diversify the productive base of our respective economies. That is, to move away from being producers and exporters of primary commodities with the aim of creating sustainable long-term jobs for our people and, in effect, to mitigate the high levels of poverty and unemployment on the continent. Now, as much as we would commend our founding fathers and mothers for their long-term vision for the continent's pathway to sustainable development, Africa, unfortunately, has very little to show for its industrialization 50 to 60 years uh, down the line. As we speak today, agricultural production on the continent is still rain dependent, making food security highly vulnerable to the vagaries of climate change. We've all seen the damage caused by El Nino and La Nina weather phenomena and how many countries are still struggling with the impact of drought on the continent. In addition, many African countries still do not have any post-Harvard food storage and processing infrastructure, leading to 30% post-harvest uh, losses estimated to be worth, and I'm sure it's more than that, uh, $4 million uh, per annum. The relevance of infrastructure development to Africa's sustainable development cannot be overemphasized. Consequently, infrastructure runs through several sustainable development goals and is core to our agenda 2063, the Africa we want, which speaks to a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Now, in addition to SDG 9, which directly deals with industry, innovation, and infrastructure, um, good hospitals and other medical infrastructure are required to deliver on SDG, sorry, SGD 3, good health and well-being. Schools are required to deliver on SDG 4. Sorry, I, I, I'm transposing these SGDs and SDGs, so um, it's Sustainable Development Goals. Um, SDG 4, Quality Education. New and additional infrastructure is required to develop on SDG DG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation. Energy infrastructure and innovations in green energy solutions are required to achieve SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. Now, as a continent, Africa's infrastructure deficit is well documented, the most severe being in the area of energy. Africa's mainly coal and hydroelectric generation of energy is not environmentally sustainable in the long term. As a continent, we need to begin to explore uh, green energy innovations such as solar energy, wind energy, bioenergy, as well as waste to energy on the continent. The poor state of our roads, rails, sea, and air transport infrastructure combined with unsupportive trade and immigration policies inhibit Af intra-African trade uh, and the movement of goods, people, and services on the continent. Our telecommunication infrastructure is also far behind the level of sophistication seen in development con uh, developed countries. Now, despite being sur surrounded by several sources of water, both inland and on our coasts, water security remains a challenge for our continent. Africa continues to struggle with health service delivery and inequalities in access to quality health care. Our educational institutions do not produce graduates that are sufficiently competitive internationally. In our respective countries, graduates from our tertiary institutes are not equipped with skills that prepare them for employment by the private sector. According to World Bank estimates, and this is quite a shocking statistic, 50% of graduates in Africa were unemployed as at the end of uh, 2016. A cursory glance at the types of skill sets required for the fourth industrial revolution enlists skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, artificial intelligence, robotics, 
most of which are not being taught in our educational institutions. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, are we ready for this fourth industrial revolution? Africa today has the youngest population in the world. 70% of our population are below the age of 35 years. It has been estimated by the World Bank that by 2020, Africa's youth population will, will increase by 42.5 million. This anticipated youth bulge has led to the speculation that Africa is about to ben benefit from a demographic dividend. However, let us ask ourselves this fundamental question. Where are the jobs that will absorb this, un un sorry, this anticipated youth population? To provide an answer to this question, I pose it that the need to diversify the productive capacity of our economies through industrialization is more urgent now than ever before. We need to create sustainable long-term jobs. The jury is still out on what exactly the role of the state should be in this. Should the state be developmental or should we let ourselves open to the market? Now these are the concerns of this AUR conference. Sub-themes of the conference include industrialization through mining and the Africa mining vision, infrastructure development, agricultural modernization, human cap capacity development, the role of the state and the role of science and technology in Africa's industrial, uh, industrialization agenda. The key question to be answered in all our discussions and presentations at this conference uh, should be, what are the opportunities for job creation and poverty alleviation? Where can we find the jobs? How can we create them in our endeavors to industrialize? It's my understanding that delegates gathered here are very knowledgeable in each of the sub-themes targeted for this conference. It is therefore my hope and expectation that the AURC 2018 will not be a talk shop, but rather at the end of these two days of brainstorming and exchange of ideas, practical and innovative solutions will emerge. African policymakers working in close collaboration with the private sector, technical support institutions, and other stakeholders or role players can then implement these proposed solutions to Africa's challenges in our quest to industrialize. Ultimately, the measure of success for our industrialization efforts should be job creation and poverty reduction. I hereby wish all of us gathered here a productive 2018 uh, conference. With that, I'm happy to declare this conference open. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sudin. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. Dan Dutoy. Uh, he is the Deputy Director General in charge of International Cooperation and Resources in the Department of Science and Technology uh, of the South African government. He will present the keynote address. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and indeed, uh, Excellencies, Ambassadors present here. It, in, it is indeed a, a great privilege for me to uh, address you this morning on behalf of the Department of, of, of Science and Technology. And I have been uh, entrusted with the, the very important responsibility to deliver what is called a, a keynote address. Now, now, normally a keynote address is supposed to be some kind of intervention which helps set the tone and inform the discussions during the rest of the event. So before I start, just first two disclaimers. Uh, the program has been down for 20 minutes. I have no intention of speaking for 20 minutes. Not only to help the program catch up with time, because we've started late, but if, if I'm going to be even remotely successful in perhaps conveying one or two key messages, I believe that is done shorter rather than, than uh, uh, through a longer amount of time. And secondly, I will not dwell much on industrialization, industrialization in Africa and its role in uh, creating employment and alleviating poverty. Not only prof because Professor Sudin and, and Professor Naria have already set the scene and we have many eminent experts which will uh, discuss these dynamics during, 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 during the next few days. But I thought it would perhaps be more appropriate to, to just reflect strategically why we are here. Why do we gather here every year under this 
theme of African unity uh, for, for Renaissance. But let me state before, before I go there, just up front, that at the heart of what we do at the Department of Science and Technology, why we are entrusted uh, by, by our government with the, the mission to be the custodian of science, technology, and innovation in South Africa, is to ensure that through science and technology, we support modernizing our economy, enhancing its competitiveness, supporting industrialization, and other processes of economic growth to improve the quality of living of our citizens and indeed to contribute uh, development uh, elsewhere on the continent. So, so a firm and unequivocal commitment to the overall uh, objective of what you will be discussing uh, here today is at the heart of what we do at the Department of Science and Technology. Let me also start by, by saying we, we very much regret that our Minister for Science and Technology, uh, Minister Mamaloko Kubayi Ngubani, or indeed my Director General, Dr. Fulma Joacha, could not be with you today. The, the Minister has to be in Parliament because of national commitments, and the Director General also has, has other responsibilities. But the African agenda continues very much to, to be at the heart uh, of our portfolio at the Department of Science and Technology. Just to share with you anecdotally, the, and this was very important for us, the very first international engagement Minister Kubayi Ngubani undertook shortly after he was appointed was to attend the next Einstein Forum uh, organized in Kigali, Rwanda, which has now become uh, one of the most eminent celebrations of excellence in African science and technology. And, and just last week, she had participated in a session of the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development, held in Geneva, where which the minister really, consistent with our leadership as chair of SADC, took a, a leadership role to mobilize the SADC nations to participate in the international debate on science and technology, specifically within the context, and this term has already been used today, of the, the fourth industrial revolution. So, let me assure you, therefore, of our political commitment and political support for the objectives you are seeking here today. But I said I wanted to reflect on, on African unity for, for, for Renaissance. Why is this so important for us at the Department of Science and Technology? And why are we a proud and an historic supporter of, 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 of this, this, uh, this annual gathering? First of all, because Africa, as I've just stated, is what we'd like to say at the heart of our international agenda for science and technology. Uh, we should be careful that we do not just say it and not do it, but it's an objective and I would like to share with you uh, some examples of which we are concertedly work to advance our African partnership agenda in science and technology. We do that through a, a range of bilateral partnerships we have with, with many of our partner countries across the continent, in southern, north, east and western Africa, often through research funding, through, for example, enabling researchers at universities to work together, but increasingly also looking at, at a strategic focus on innovation. It's perhaps more challenging, but certainly not, not less important. And how do we link also African, other African enterprises with South African enterprises with the objective of harnessing technological innovation for, for the growth of our, our continent? And then we have a whole range of portfolio of agreements and instruments uh, seeking to, to support that. But secondly, we are also actively committed to strengthen the, the various multilateral frameworks uh, for science and technology on our continent. It has now often been referred to that South Africa is currently chairing SADC. A very important milestone for us is on the 21st and the 22nd of June, when Minister Gubayi Nangubani, with Minister Spandor and Minister Smuchekha, will host the annual SADC ministerial meeting of science, technology, and education, where at the heart of that agenda will be exactly what is the response of knowledge and education and innovation to support industrialization and SADC. But at the department, we have not waited for the opportunity, the privilege to chair SADC, to invest in the SADC agenda. We have, for example, now for a number of years have seconded an official to the SADC Secretariat in Gaborone to be specifically responsible for science, technology, and innovation in the SADC um, policy deliberations. We are also uh, leading a number of initiatives which the, the SADC ministers will, will consider when they meet, such as, for example, doing a comprehensive analysis of what are the needs for engin engineering, what engineering capacities do we have in the, in the region, and what do we need to invest to build those capacities to, for example, uh, supporting industrialization. We are close to completion with a comprehensive exercise to do a foresight, a technology foresight exercise, which should inform for energy, which should inform future investment 
decisions for energy technology in the SADC region. But of course, it's not only SADC, there's also the African Union, its agenda 2063, and the, the Comprehensive Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, STISA, which we continue to support. South Africa has been, for example, identified as host for the Science Institute of the Pan-African University Network, and there are a number of these other initiatives which South Africa uh, is, is supporting. But we also don't limit our African partnership agenda, our Africa engagement to uh, initiatives limited to the region and continent. Wherever South Africa engages and our department engages internationally, we seek to advance the African agenda. South Africa, for example, plays a, a leadership role in the joint Africa-EU strategy, which has created new funding programs for research and innovation in sustainable agriculture, uh, food and nutrition security, now also sustainable energy. Uh, last year, we were led to discussions with Japan as part of the Tokyo International Conference for Africa's Development to ensure that science and technology plays an important role there. Similarly, with our partners in China as part of the, the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC, and indeed very much now part of South Africa's chairing of the BRICS Summit. We will have uh, the, the BRICS Summit later this year where we, it's always been important for our government that as part of our membership of BRICS, we seek to advance a broader African agenda. So I hope I've convinced you that as far as the Africa theme, through practical action and investment, this is a priority for the Department of Science and Technology. But of course, the, the, the theme of the conference is also about unity. And I think, again, it's common cause that no one here will dispute why unity on our continent is so important. So what I would like to reflect really is on the concrete measures we can take that through investment in research, innovation, and science and technology, we can strengthen that, that unity. First of all, of course, unity starts with people. People should know each other. I think it's still sad that for many of our young researchers across the continent, uh, many of the training, exchange, mobility programs which are afforded to them is not intra-African but seeks to revert to the old north-south paradigm. So I think it's absolutely important that we continue to invest as Africans in creating a next generation of African researchers whose first and primary networks should be on their own, their own continent. So investing in, in programs and networks which brings African researchers together, very much as we are doing here, here today, is absolutely strategic if we want to build that unity, because unity will start with, with people. Of course, institutions, critically important, strengthening pan-African uh, institutions, we support very actively, for example, as a department, both the African Academy of Science, and this year we'll have the privilege of hosting its uh, assembly, the network of African Academy of Science, which brings together the national academies, and uh, in, indeed, uh, for example, structures and their partner here, uh, the regional office of the International Council for, for, for Science for Africa. Also, research infrastructures can play a very important role in building this African unity. Uh, you will have certainly have heard of South Africa's hosting of the Square Kilometre Array, the global, the plans for the, the world's um, largest radio telescope which will be constructed uh, in South Africa and Australia. But a very important part of that is uh, the, the African partnership dimension, because in later phases of this project, stations will also be built in other African countries. So with our partners in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Namibia, Mauritius, Madagascar, uh, and Zambia, uh, we are developing what is called the Africa Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, which will be the first comprehensive pan-African network of uh, uh, astronomy institutions. So also for institutional and infrastructure investment, we should be building this unity. And then, then lastly also with, with funding, because nothing binds you together, nothing unites you together as a, a real commitment of investment in, in, in resources. I think we, we all agree here that uh, we share common challenges as, 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 as a continent, therefore our response should be a common one, and developing joint funding programs, joint funding mechanisms will not only allow us to more effectively address, this, address those, it will also build the, this unity uh, we speak uh, to. I mean, our department, in partnership with the National Research Foundation and some international partners are, for example, supporting the Science Grant Council Initiative for Africa, which seeks to build across the continent new institutional capacity for national research funding, uh, which will help us to have this new focus on African research funding for Africa's um, challenges and priorities. But then, Lastly, to conclude, uh, the Renaissance, of course, we all speak about Renaissance. We, we all want to work for a Renaissance, uh, uh, a, a so-called new dawn, new dawn. 
But it's very important that we also reflect on the road to travel if we are to arrive at destination. And I think it should start, first of all, by building on what's there. And something which we, I don't think, do enough as Africans, and that is to take pride in what already exists and what has been achieved, and including in the science and technology domain. There is still not only international, but on our own continent, significant ignorance of the achievements of African scientists. Not many people know. I would wonder if I would post a question here, if you, who of our colleagues would know the laureates of the Kwame Nkrumah African Union Science Awards, which every year celebrates excellence in, 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 in African science. So let us aspire and let us work um, to the, towards this renaissance, but build on what is there and take pride in the achievements. But it's not only about taking pride, it's also about taking responsibility, and it's also about, about, about taking our ownership. Let me, we have some diplomats in the audience. In an earlier life, I had been a diplomat, diplomat myself, but let me perhaps be slightly politically incorrect. I always feel very much ashamed as a representative of an African government, if we sit in Addis Ababa in meetings of the African Union and we discuss about programs and initiatives and all of those programs are funded by donors. And as a collective of African nations, we are unable to mobilize resources to support it, to these initiatives. So I think it's no accusation do not misinterpret me. First of all, speaking to myself and to all of us here, it's very important that if we want to achieve this renaissance, we take ownership and responsibility for that agenda. We can speak all we want to about a fourth industrial revolution and the opportunities it presents for Africa. We will not make it work for Africa unless we take ownership ourselves and set our own agenda. Otherwise, we'll always be responding to someone else's agenda. And if someone else sets the agenda, they set that agenda first and foremost for themselves. That, that's the, the way the world works. So let me just then conclude with the last point for the Renaissance. It starts also with action. Um, without mentioning where, most recently I participated in a multilateral engagement for my government. We worked very hard for a number of days, argued with partners about words, produced a long document, seven of eight pages, which we all applauded and collected, and then we went home and that document will stay wherever it stays and nothing will happen. So unfortunately, that's also unfortunately too often a legacy of the liberations on whether it's industrialization, whether it's growth, what we should do to advance the objectives for our continent. So the call for action is really urgent. It's imperative. I think it's, again, we, something we, we all subscribe to, but I thought it opportune and appropriate to, to uh, repeat that here. And I certainly very much look forward to the outcome statement. Hopefully, it will not be an eight or 10 pages document, which we will read and forget, but very concrete, very action oriented, which will assist us to advance this agenda, an agenda which I have no doubt we all share the, the commitment here to, and that is to, through investment in knowledge, in, in education and innovation, work for a better continent. Let me just conclude by expressing the department's appreciation to Professor Sodin as the, the leader of the HSRC and his entire staff for every year putting together this very impressive program. It's become, a, I think, one of the highlights I will not exaggerate also in our depart department's calendar for exactly what it seeks to achieve by bringing people together uh, for building networks, friendships, and, and solidarity. But most importantly, I hope for robust and hopefully also provocative debate, which, we which can inform our work and, and serve to guide our work. Let me also thank the, the colleagues from the Department of Science and Technology, Mampe and her team, who I know have invested a lot in, in, in delivering the su success. And I would like to, to wish you well, as I've said. I hope I've not exceeded 20 minutes because then I would have not been uh, consistent with my own, my own statement. But if uh, by emphasizing the need for taking ownership, responsibility for this, for this agenda and moving to action, uh, I may have perhaps planted some seeds with you, then I would be very happy with that I would have achieved this objective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that uh, inspiring speech. I think you have said it all, so I shall not uh, uh, repeat uh, the main point of your, your speech. We are going to take a short intermission to allow for those who are on the podium to exit, go back, and then we will invite... Uh, the opening plenary uh, speakers to, 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 to come to the podium. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I am Fifi Peters. Well, it is the eighth African Unity for Renaissance International Conference, and it's also the Africa Expo Day, and that is kicking off here today at the St. George Hotel in Irene, Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. The theme for this year's conference is Accelerating Industrialization in Africa, looking at the implications for a poverty and also for job creation. Now, industrialization is at the core of Africa's development agenda, and that core being to reduce poverty and to create jobs. For the next hour or so, we'll be hearing from various thought leaders who will be engaging us and weighing in, in on this conversation about how best to accelerate industrialization on the continent. The show is being broadcast on Facebook Live, so we do encourage engagement from audience members on Facebook as well as across the African continent. The hashtag, of course, for this event is AU. AUR 2018. That is AUR 2018. And the other hashtag that you can make use of is hashtag Africa Day Expo 2018. So we really do encourage some interaction from you, our audience members, as well as those watching this on Facebook. In fact, there will be an opportunity for you to engage some of the panelists that will be speaking here today. So if you want to Facebook any of your questions or even on Twitter, ask that using that hashtag, we will be able to engage with you on this critical matter. Right, without further ado, let's get straight to the conversation of today. Allow me to introduce some of the speakers that we will be hearing from. Uh, sitting right next to me is Professor Mike Morris, who is the PRISM and Economics Department. He's from there at the University of Cape Town. We do have Mr. Niraj Vij from the African Development Bank. Uh, sitting next to uh, Niraj is Dr. Valerie Naidu from the Water Research Commission. And then we also have Ms. Uh, Mambei Chaba, who is the Chief Director at the Department of Science and Technology. And lastly, uh, Dr. Kojo Bus Busai, who is uh, from the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So for the purpose of allowing you to know exactly who you're speaking with, I would like to ask our panelists just to give us a brief introduction of themselves and the kind of work they do in the way of, you know, advancing the narrative of industrializing the continent further. Uh, Prof, I mean, I'm picking on you because you're sitting closest to me. Uh, allow me to ask uh, exactly what it is that you do. Um, hi. Uh, I work on global value chains, I work on regional value chains, I work on globalization, I do work on industrial policy and industrialization, and I mostly work um, on Africa. I do a lot of work also on, um, I've done quite a lot of work on, on resources, minerals, um, agro-processing, but I've done a huge amount of work actually on apparel on garments and, and textiles um, in sub-Saharan Africa. I'll do other things, but I don't think I'll mention that on TV. <laughs> Nourish? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the Chief Investment Officer for African Development Bank based out of its regional office in Pretoria. I focus on making uh, investments in, in uh, industry sectors uh, in the Southern Africa region as well as uh, in, in the wider Africa continent. Hi, I'm Valerie Naido. I'm from the Water Research Commission. Uh, my portfolio is business development and innovations, but really what we try to do is figure out how we as the Water Research Commission play a role in this broader water value chain and how our investment in innovations and research is taken basically to the market and the public sector and used and implemented uh, eff eff efficiently and effectively. So our role basically is not just about what our, what our investment is doing, but also in terms of how do we influence policy to make sure innovation actually reaches the market. Okay. And My responsibilities at the DST involves managing the science, technology, and innovation uh, engagements in the African continent through our 26 bilateral engagements, managing our Africa multilateral engagements, uh, that would be the, within the SADC region, African Union, and strategic partnerships between Africa and other strategic partners, 
And last, it also includes managing our STI global partnerships through organizations such as the United Nations, uh, some of the South-South organizations, the OECD, and so on. And lastly, Jack. Good morning. Uh, I work for the African Mineral Development Center as the coordinator, which is uh, an institute or a center that was established by the African Union uh, in 2013 to basically provide the guidance, the policy guidance, advisory services to African Union member states to use their mineral resources to industrialize the economies. Uh, basically, that's, that's the mandate of, this, of the center. All right. So let's actually talk about that because right now we do know that most African economies are, are very much dependent on commodities, some single uh, commodities. And we've heard from the speakers this morning that, you know, the narrative to industrialize our economies a lot further, as good as our intentions have been uh, the past 50 to 60 years, not enough has been done. So, Doc, let's speak about that now. Let's speak about the opportunities that our, our, our economies have to diversify themselves away from that commodity dependence. Thank you. Uh, basically, we all agree that industrialization is a pillar for job creation on, on this continent. And, and particularly at this uh, time in Africa's uh, development trajectory, but also its development uh, agenda. I think industrialization has been on the agenda for quite some time, uh, as one of the opening speakers indicated this morning. Since African countries became independent, there has been the, the, the need to industrialize the economy. However, I think this time around, the emphasis has been on how do we use our competitive advantage or our comparative advantage uh, in the global scheme of things. And it is clear that Africa has reserves of about 30% or more in some particular commodities of our natural resource endowments that gives us a particular edge in terms of using that to industrialize the economy. The key, though, is how does Africa develop value chains, viable competitive value chains, that will allow Africa to do that. And currently, uh, all the indications are that there are opportunities to do that, uh, whether it's in the upstream uh, segments of the mineral resource development, or particularly the downstream uh, whereby opportunities exist for us to beneficiate, which basically means add value to the raw commodities that normally has been exported outside the continent. So then the question is, how do we do this both individually as countries, but also regionally, collectively within our sub-regions, but even more broadly continentally? Uh, the recent adoption of the African free trade area particularly provides a unique opportunity for us to do that which basically means factors of production can move from one country to another almost freely with very limited uh, tariffs on them, which allows countries or collectively to mobilize these resources to add value. There are several opportunities upstream which has not been taken advantage of, and that implies that those factors that go into the production of our mines itself can be used as a catalyst to industrialize our continent. So either way you look at it, even in agriculture, uh, the potential is enormous. So I think the determination to industrialize a continent has never been as keen as uh, currently it has been discussed both continentally and also in terms of sub-regions across the continent. No, for sure. And I mean, even in this narrative that we're all trying to drive of increasing uh, trade relations between African countries, uh, the problem is we did, we did hear this morning of the uh, infrastructure deficit that's inhibiting more trade taking place uh, between us and our neighbors. But uh, Prof, I'd, or, or rather, yes, Prof Mike, I'd like to pick up on um, Dr. Kojo's point of uh, beneficiation, you know, being another area that we should be able to exploit. I mean, we're naturally endowed with uh, resources, so we need to be able to to use them more competitively. A number of African countries are trying to drive uh, more beneficiation taking place within their uh, countries and economies and doing away with the current system whereby you're having to import the very same uh, mineral that came from your ground at a premium. My question to you is how best do we drive this narrative of beneficiation such that we don't have kickback from multinational companies that say, oh, your laws are too stringent, we're packing up, we're leaving. 
I wish you'd ask me that question later, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can only answer that question if you ask, understand the question of linkages, production right. linkages. So the question of, I, I'll, never mind what I wrote here. No, let's, let's actually no, no, go no, with no, the no, 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 production fine. linkages. Don't worry about it. Don't worry <laughs> okay. about it. I can ad lib. Um, <laughs> The question of industrialization, it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to focus on industrialization and you're trying to de develop and deepen value added um, industrial activities in your country, and I say industrial in a broad sense, that includes agro-processing, et cetera. If you're trying to do this in order to uh, create uh, jobs, then you won't do it in extraction, in mining extraction or in um, oil extraction, etc. You can only do it by looking at the linkages to um, this resource-based um, activity. So I stress production linkages all the time, which are backward, forward, and horizontal uh, production linkages. Beneficiation is a forward linkage. Mm -hmm. Forward linkages are really important in agro-processing because, and I'll come, I'll maybe, I'll say something about that in, when I speak in the next session. But I'm really skeptical about this hype in Africa about beneficiation. Because that's actually ducking out of the issue. The real issue is, is focusing in terms of mining. The real issue in mining is how do you develop backward linkages. It's much easier to develop backward linkages into mining than it is in, to do beneficiation. Why? What do you There's, mean by backward linkages? No, well, let me just say this about, you asked me about beneficiation. <laughs> There's a huge step and a jump mm -hmm. from pulling iron ore and copper out of the country, out, out of the for the, in the country out of the ground and producing pots and pans or tables or doing something else. There's a huge step between uh, making, a, uh, uh, producing manufactured goods and mining that stuff. There's not such a big jump backwards if you're talking about the uh, supplier industries that are required for your mining activities. Mm -hmm. That's the story of South Africa. The history of South Africa, take away apartheid, take away race, take away all of that, which is difficult to take away. The economic history of South Africa in terms of industrialization is the development of backward linkages in terms of engineering services, mine, metal services, a whole lot of services and, and production activities that go into uh, mining. So focus first and foremost on that. That will enable you to develop manufacturing capabilities because it's all about capabilities. That will enable you to develop manufacturing capabilities which can spin off sideways into a variety of other activities which may allow you to come back again to beneficiation. But if you just talk about beneficiation, beneficiation, you tell me how. You, from pulling, cop, from pulling um, iron ore out of the ground and producing it, you can jump to making uh, manufactured goods that are tables and chairs, um, uh, tripods for, the, for those guys over there taking movies, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that I'm opposed to beneficiation. The first stage of beneficiation is processing, turning copper into processed copper. Go for that. That's closer to, you know, to your heart. But if you only stress beneficiation, as we all do in Africa, and forget about the other linkages, then that, I think we're making a mistake. That is not the story about agro-processing. If you're talking about beneficiation, meaning forward linkages in agriculture, absolutely. I think that's a critical way that we have to go. Sorry, it's a long-winded way of answering All right, then I'll, I'll probe you further about the opportunities for the agricultural sector in just a moment. But Mampe, maybe let's speak to uh, you a bit about, I mean, the skills development in the country. We've just heard from uh, uh, Prof uh, talking about how, you know, we can't necessarily just advance uh, from taking things out the ground to now uh, manufacturing and processing all of that, because we also heard this morning that there's a skills uh, deficit, particularly in terms of the jobs uh, that will be required for the future. But how can science and technology advance in this role of Africa wanting to industrialize itself further? Thank you very much for the question. I would like perhaps to start by addressing the Prof's question or remarks there, because I think Africa limits itself by thinking that you can only do so much when there is a whole lot more that you can do through forward looking, through foresight, and uh, planning for the future. So I don't think there is a reason that Africa cannot plan to be one of the top beneficiators in, in the world. But of course we need skills to do that. And a number of reports have indicated that Africa is lacking far behind. 
uh, the African capacity reports, the 2017 reports, indicates that Africa needs something like 4.3 million engineers to really become industrialized. It needs something like 1.6 million agricultural scientists. We have not even begun talking about a state of readiness to address the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, skills like robotics, artificial, artificial intelligence, um, biotechnologists, and, and all of that, we, we are still lagging far behind. So that's already the first opportunity where Africa can already start building uh, the capacity and the resources required to get there. The STI strategy for Africa, STISA 2024, also has technical competence as one of the four pillars uh, to really get STI to contribute towards development. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest challenge as well, even if we build all of that capacity, we will lose all of those skills if we don't ensure that the continent is ready to absorb those skills in the continent. Mm -hmm. The UNDESA report reports that something like half a million people from Africa settled in OECD countries in a period of about five years. 43% of those were from Zimbabwe. And look at Zimbabwe now. If they had those skills settling in Zimbabwe, we'd be talking a different story with regards to Zimbabwe. So although we can say we have policies on STI in the continent, I think about two thirds of the African continent have got STI policies. You need the skills to implement those policies and it's absolutely crucial that you look at the entire pipeline all the way from primary education to higher education. So skills do play a critical role. Mm -hmm. Skills playing a critical role there, but as is water. A lot of the uh, investments right now are going in towards the energy space in terms of addressing uh, some of the infrastructure backlogs. Um, is enough, is enough uh, Valerie, going to the water space? And perhaps you can begin by telling us, I mean, what role does water play in industrialization? So I think firstly, let's, let's start by saying that I think if Africa really wants to transcend and be competitive, you have to set bold visions and you have to be courageous around that. Mm -hmm. I do agree to some extent you have to be realistic about the steps you take in trying to get there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't set that bold vision, the rest of the world is not standing still. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you always behind the curve or somewhere along the line, Afri Africa's gonna basically get ahead of the curve. I think that's the first thing. In terms of water, water in my opinion, and I think this is where people think about water incorrectly. Water, energy, roads, transport, the connectivity platforms that we are creating are all enablers. They all are the inputs towards this industrialization that we're talking about. So you can't think about doing one without the other. You can't under invest in one without thinking about the other. Mm -hmm. It's the same as saying, how do you seed the new jobs. The new jobs of the future is coming through innovation and science and technology. Mm. But you can't play too much of a role on just science. You then have to create the development platforms in order to meet those capability de deficits that we have in Africa. And I think that's where we need to make some really concerted effort as to if, for example, we need these engineers in these areas, then how do we collectively as well invest in that going forward? Are we going to import skills from outside in order to do that? That's not sustainable as well if, if we really do have a bold vision. Mm -hmm. Water has an op opportunity to look at things differently, I think, in Africa, particularly because we are constrained. Mm -hmm. We are basically facing major constraints, physical constraints around water. And water, in my opinion, has the opportunity, to, and I, I've listed like three areas. So even if you look at infrastructure, currently we do centralize big, right? 70% of our population is gonna be in the cities. But why aren't we thinking build small, plan big? Because if you plan big, there's an industrialization component that will come into how we do this smartly in Africa, mm -hmm. which is different to the way currently the developed world thinks about it, which is largely centralized. Mm -hmm. So you have modest, flexible systems, modular systems, and it, it, it then becomes more inclusive for more entrepreneurs and, and more businesses to actually partake in that space. Sanitation, next generation sanitation. Is it really about moving you know, sewage around with water? Or is it about this sort of system that is able to transform your sewer, uh, sewage into something that is less uh, dangerous or a valuable resource? Mm -hmm. And in that space, there are other partners working in this space. But if you don't invest in that, you're never really gonna get to that space because we're always gonna be doing incremental investment, which doesn't lead to big change. Thirdly, big data. 
big data in water, big data anywhere. Uh, big data basically has the opportunity of, of actually trans translating across all sectors. It's not a, just a sector on its own. It, 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 there's linkages around big data, and when you invest in that, it can then put in, it basically has an ability to change water, energy, <coughs> telecommunications, anything. Mm. And for me, big data, for example, we, we in science sometimes just talk about data and the fuzziness of data, data and how do we manage the complexity. But big data is about scalability of infrastructure. It's about how do you match the, uh, the ecosystems between private sector and public sector mm -hmm. in order to make big data work for us. What are the resources we require in that space? And only from there can you get basically the integration, the extraction, and ultimately to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is not just little things that we do incrementally. You have to think about it in a, in a much more bolder way in order to achieve that. And, and in my opinion, with Africa, with, with some of our constraints, thinking collectively may get us there faster than doing it alone. No, no, for sure. I mean, teamwork always makes uh, any dream work. But ultimately, all these uh, uh, projects that we're talking about require money. And uh, Naraj, I'd just like you to speak to me about I mean, where the African Development Bank uh, sits. Your view of the uh, financing opportunities and perhaps also the constraints in the way of indus industrialization on the continent. Sure. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, I, I fully appreciate uh, the points which my colleagues have made. Uh, particularly around the bold vision. I think if we, if we talk of countries like Japan, Korea, they have undergone rapid uh, progress, and that was because of the ambition which their political leadership set for themselves, uh, and then provided a stable policy environment for the long term. I, I think that is, uh, for first, we need to talk about the constraints that are stopping industrialization. And policy and regulatory framework is right up there. Uh, and and uh, second is uh, the conducive business environment uh, in the countries for private sector. Infrastructure, everybody talk about uh, infrastructure deficit, uh, the, the logistics. It, it's cheaper to bring a ship to um, many ports in Africa than uh, take goods from within, within the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a big constraint. Uh, and third is access to markets. So Africa is one of the least integrated continents. So, so the, uh, the, the companies within Africa do not have access to African markets itself. Uh, and uh, fourth, of course, is uh, they, they talked about skills. Uh, you, you need the right kind of skill sets to, uh, to build industrialization. And you build, need entrepreneurship. Everybody is talking about jobs here. But uh, looking at the bank, it takes, if we, if we look at large investments that we make, it takes a couple of million dollars to uh, create one long-term sustainable job. Mm -hmm. And how is that possible to create if you have to create millions and millions of jobs? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to talk about entrepreneurship mindset and, and help develop the value chains. And value chains is all about entrepreneurship, uh, which uh, uh, we can talk about later. And then it comes to capital, which is, which is once. And when we talk about capital, we always talk about bankable projects, the projects that have been put together in, in the right way that they can attract capital in a sustainable manner. Mm. And for, when, if we talk about capital resources, there are several resources available to government. Uh, I think this morning they talked about reducing dependent on, dependence on external markets, uh, particularly aid, because uh, as we know, more and the, the aid is going down year by year uh, from, the, from the developed economies. So African countries have to look at strengthening their domestic resources. First and foremost is a tax base. Uh, Africa, uh, at, the, at the continent level, they collect around $520 billion of tax revenue. Uh, and, but the tax rate in Africa, average tax collection rate is 20%, whereas in OECD countries, it is around 35%. So, so there is a tax base which can be strengthened, as well as compliance, uh, compliance with, the, with the tax. Then remittances. Remittances can be a big source. Africa re receives around $62 billion of remittances every year from uh, its diaspora. That, uh, strengthening local capital markets. Uh, it, I, I think this is one of the advantages which South Africa has. Your, your domestic markets are very strong and, and liquid, but that is not the situation in the rest of the continent. Mm -hmm. So strengthening domestic capital markets is, is very important to create a long-term uh, source of capital mm -hmm. for these, project, uh, these projects. Then, of course, uh, coming, to, uh, coming to multilaterals. Multilaterals are a big source of funding for, 
projects in Africa, multilateral as well as bilateral agencies. And they're increasing, they're stepping up. They're increasing their investments in the continent. Access to capital markets, international capital markets. Uh, many uh, African countries have successfully raised bonds in international capital markets in the recent uh, past. Uh, so so th that is another source of revenue. Then, of course, uh, private investors. Uh, the, so when, if, the, if the governments really want to take this forward, they have to talk about public-private partnerships. And that is where I was talking about having the right policy environment and having a conducive business environment in the country. That will attract FDI. So there, there are various opportunities, and there, there are various sources mm -hmm. to tackle the problem. Could we Thank probe you. a little bit more on this theme of having the right policy in the environment? And Dr. Kojo, uh, just uh, to, to speak with you, I mean, does, does, does uh, the idea of a policy or the policy constraints come up to those uh, players in the mineral space who are looking to industrialize the mineral, the mineral spaces more? Yes. Uh, the issue of policy is eminently important, and it starts actually with vision, a bold vision, collectively defined to transform uh, the economies of this continent. And that's what precisely the African mining vision uh, seeks to achieve in the context of mineral resources. It is a paradigm-shifting agenda that clearly identifies the constraints, policy, as well as the other forms of constraints that other panelists have alluded to. But it is uh, sort of a new approach, partly because it shifts the emphasis of mineral governance from rents seeking or rents maximization, which is governments throughout the continent, you know, over the last several decades, have tended to focus on collecting taxes on mineral investments. And, and if you look at it, that has been the preoccupation, policy-wise. But the African mining vision tends the entire sector around. It says, look, besides collecting rents on the resource concession, what can we do besides that? And that's where the linkages come in. The backward, forward, side stream, lateral linkages. So these are the new thinking around policy. But it cannot happen by accident. It takes collective effort, the political will of the elites, and maybe a different kind of state as well. But, Doc, uh, I understand that impl implementation of this has been rather slow. I mean, what's holding things back? Well, changing mineral regimes, it's, it takes a while. I mean, reforms, for obvious reasons. One is uh, political will. There's also entrenched interest, uh, let's face it. I mean, the, the whole mining sector, I'm sure you've heard the resource curse mm -hmm. as a phenomenon uh, on this continent, whereby because economies uh, sort of depend on this one particular uh, sector, uh, it tends to create all kinds of dysfunctions, economically, politically, even social, culturally. To move away from that takes time. It takes deliberate effort, but it can be done. So obviously, the vision ought to be implemented through consultation mm -hmm. to align all the interests within countries mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody is on board. And of course, beyond the countries also, you need a regional mining vision, mm -hmm. as we have in the Sadek sub-region, whereby the regional economic community itself ought to align their various policies around mineral sector. Mm -hmm. The issue of whether Africa dwells on backward or forward linkages is important. And I agree with Professor Morris' um, uh, opinion that forward sort of beneficiation is not for every country. In fact, if you look at the continent, the trends are such that we have to optimize first the backward linkages, meaning the supply chain that feeds into the extraction exercise itself. That's where the opportunities are, because they are low-hanging fruits. Government can set up industries that can manufacture these inputs, some of which are not very intensive in terms of capital. But ultimately, some countries can also begin the agenda of beneficiation. Mm -hmm. If you look at SADC region, I think some of the prerequisites for beneficiation exist. South Africa is one, Namibia, and some of these countries. Also the fact that this sub-region has monopoly of several commodities. Mm -hmm. If you look at the platinum group of metals, 90% is found in this region globally. So that competitiveness of monopoly power can be used to beneficiate some of these minerals. So I, I think that it, there will be a variation of approaches. But ultimately, there is a concerted effort to change the policy 
approach to how Africans utilizes this natural resource endowment. And I think the African Mining Vision has played a key role in catalyzing this particular policy agenda. For sure. Uh, Prof, let's speak about those low-hanging fruits. And as I understand, I mean, you identified agriculture as being one of them. So how do we exploit this? Could I just say something first about vision? Mm. And I just one, one small comment on the water issue. I think water is really, really important. And I'm pleased you raised modular, small-scale approaches. More important is, or just as important, is energy. Without energy, actually, we go nowhere. Mm. And we have to break away from this large, centralized, nationally controlled um, provision of electricity. Um, and there's, there are real opportunities with renewable energy to make those kinds of breakthroughs um, in Africa. And that's one area we aren't talking about, but I think it's a critical sure. um, area as well. The, I agree with you about vision, Kojo, but the problem with vision in Africa is you have to have a vision. You have to know what you want. Um, but the problem is it's very easy to speak one vision and do something else. We had a president for eight years who had one, who spoke one vision and then basically his main principal vision was enriching himself and his cronies. Mm -hmm. So corruption becomes a critical part mm -hmm. of the process in Africa and we have to handle this and tackle it um, head on. South Africa is the best example of what corruption leads to. It leads mm -hmm. to deindustrialization because it doesn't lead to a real implementation, a vision and an implementation which focuses upon general value added which focuses upon deepening um, industrial activities, mm -hmm. which focuses upon job creation, um, and which focuses upon medium-sized enterprises. Who's going to give you the most um, job, jobs? Actually, they're medium-sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. Medium-sized enterprises get sidestepped because they're not the most politically um, uh, They're not the area where you're going to get the most political votes. You're going to get political votes in all sorts of other um, ways and other places. Mm -hmm. So focus upon those if you want to have backward linkages and if you want to do something that's of, of substance. Your question about agriculture. Listen, the key question here about forward linkages or um, agro processing is that you cannot do... The thing about agriculture, it's an additive value chain. One thing follows another. It's not the same situation as manufacturing type value chains when you can do things in parallel, which means you can get things done in Southeast Asia and send a part to somewhere else and produce the iPhone. You can spread it out over the world. When you're engaged in agriculture and agro-processing, it follows sequentially. You cannot do something without something else um, having happened. So the key thing is how do you capture the value into your own particular country, add the skills that are required to do that, and take that step and capture that step, haul it back into, your, into Africa, and the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And how do you engage in the leading value chains like Nestle around cocoa to say, actually, we're going to do a whole series of steps before we get to chocolate production mm. okay, and pull those back into Africa. That's what I call, added, those are additive value chains, that's what I call forward um, linkages, and right. that produces what I think is what Africa needs. It's a productive industrial policy mm -hmm. which focus, uh, focuses upon industrialization. In mining, I think backward linkages is the way to go. And that's the way you develop learning, capability building, building skills building, um, um, etc. And I've said too much now. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, you did touch on a very important uh, uh, problem and hindrance to advancing our economies being corruption. But we do have a situation now where we're seeing new dispensations happen across uh, many African countries. I mean, here at home in South Africa, we are calling it the new dawn, as they are in Zimbabwe, where uh, there was a new uh, leadership change there. And also in Angola, when we've seen there's, a, there's, a, there's an understanding that, you know, this, 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 this constraint of corruption needs to be swept clean and we are seeing some administrators are taking part in that. I mean, Mampe, you have got a new uh, minister in your portfolio, and we heard uh, a little bit earlier on today about her, her readiness and her commitment to really play an active role in improving uh, governance there at the Department of Science and Technology and all other things. But talk to me about that. I mean, under this new administration, what is the ability of the Department of Science and uh, Technology to really enhance uh, its, 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 its role and its, and its will to uh, industrialize the continent further? And perhaps maybe there you can just touch on some of the projects that you're busy with. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the role of the Department of Science and Technology should not be seen as a standalone uh, role. For its role to be enhanced, it has to be seen to contribute to all of the other government departments. If you look at health, the science has a role to play there. If you look at agriculture, if you look at water and sanitation. So I think that the biggest uh, concern currently in the continent is the silo mentality, that science does not seem to be cutting across and even in the absorption of technologies that are produced by researchers and innovators. There's still a big missing link between translating those innovations into solutions that can contribute to service delivery, for an example. So that's a gap that we are still battling with within the Department of Science and Technology, but together with a whole lot of other government departments through the cluster system, we're trying to address that. And that's sort of the same mentality that we take when we engage in the continent, that science should not be seen to be uh, an answer on its own, but it has to contribute to socioeconomic challenges. It has to address political concerns. And the key card to play there is to also play the political mind. You know that politicians have got a five-year term. They have to deliver within that five-year period. So you go into a country looking at the major challenges that a country faces, and it then collectively try to come up with a solution to address that challenge. The challenges will come when you have to co-create or co-develop knowledge and exploit knowledge that we do not have sufficient uh, policy regulatory environment, so if you like, uh, to, to deal with that effectively. Uh, issues like intellectual property, for example, how do you deal with cross-border intellectual property issues? How do you deal with technology transfer when there's no framework that guides how that is to be done? Lastly, though, most importantly, is also how to bring in your trade departments, uh, your economic development departments, so that once solutions have been found, they can be upscaled, produced in industrial scale to address the socioeconomic challenges in a more meaningful manner. Right. Some of the projects that we engage with, um, they, they are varied in nature, but uh, if you look at the static industrialization strategy, for an example, it emphasizes four main areas, and we are trying to address all of those areas. The prof spoke about opportunities in the renewable energy space. If you look at the, the, the challenge in the continent also is not so much generating electricity, but storing electricity. So we're trying to address the energy storage capacity issues. And if you look at the, the wealth of natural resources found in the continent, uh, with, between the DRC, Zimbabwe, South Africa, we have all of the precursor materials to produce lithium ion batteries. So, Lithium, manganese, cobalt, they all found in abundance within that region. So there's no reason that you cannot create a regional value chain looking at the capacity and the minerals found in that region. So it, we're doing some work in renewable energies. Uh, if you look at the continent as well, it is the most genetically diverse continent in the world. So there is no reason that you cannot test pharmaceutical products in the region and in the continent because we have the genetic makeup to, you know, and the market to, to, to absorb all of those products. So we are also doing some work within that area. Uh, last, perhaps I can also uh, talk to uh, agro-processing as well. We are championing a number of projects within the region that look at how, especially based on indigenous knowledge, the, the indigenous crops that are grown in abundance in the continent, how do we make sure that we, we, we add value to those to produce both uh, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals. An example I could give is that we have partnered with Nestle to produce uh, the two-minute noodles that contain morojo, amaranthus, because uh, oh. it's, it, it's highly nutritious, but it has been underutilized. But if you put it in a form that is, cons is, is acceptable by the, most of the consumers, then you're able to access markets that you've not have access before. So those are just some of the projects. Well, that's quite that interesting, have. especially for many of us, you know, who get home late at night and you don't necessarily have time to cook, you can have a nutritious meal there. But <laughs> Valerie, I mean, the role of a renewable energy has come up quite a bit uh, from everybody here. And uh, perhaps you can speak to me more about how do we realize opportunities uh, within this space, particularly when it comes to realizing the opportunities that water presents uh, to advance the narrative of industrialization. So I think the, the traditional approach is always to look at hydropower. But if you look at uh, aspects within the water space around water and energy, even the water energy food nexus, 
uh, you'll realize that uh, essentially, for example, if you've got major pipes, you can draw out hydroconduit energy from it. Uh, and there, there's a spin off for small and medium businesses. Uh, but you need to build the capability so that, you know, when you're running off these uh, infrastructure systems that the, the risk is minimized. So there's those capability bulls that we're not necessarily getting to, even though the opportunities are there and can be presented uh, going forward. I think if you look at uh, the water energy food uh, nexus, for example, uh, thinking about, you know, how to use water more efficiently and then use alternate energy sources together with how we process, I mean, grow food, but also process food. Uh, needs to be thought about in that much more um, sophisticated way rather than the simple value chains across sectoral lines. So if I look at, for example, uh, water uh, efficiencies, for example, in the system, uh, we're nowhere near to where we should be. As a, as a physically constrained um, uh, country and continent, uh, to some extent, we're quite uh, wasteful around the water space. And we're not really getting into the spaces where we're looking at the resource efficiency. So, so shift away from the wasteful practices into spaces where resources become uh, a key criteria. And through that, the spin-off companies also come. Because in the traditional sense of water, we normally provide a service. But we don't necessarily think about all the waste products and how we could use that going forward. So the circular economy comes in. So I think later on in a session, uh, some of my WRC colleagues with some of the researchers are speaking around the water and sanitation opportunities in that space. And you know, the idea then is to, how, how do we also think about food and agriculture in Africa differently to the traditional ways of growing? So drought resistant crops, for example, or saline resistant crops. Uh, you know, in much of our, our land space has huge amounts of sal salinity in it. So it's, it's also about how, how does science and technology contribute to shifting uh, into different spaces where we don't necessarily have to rely on just the traditional means going forward. So I think in that, that space around the water energy renewable space, uh, there is huge opportunity to look at energy differently as to purely from a energy from an electricity source to the sort of different renewable options on the table, whether it's solar, whether it's uh, wind, or, or whether it's just other alternate sources that will come about. So I'm glad that in South Africa, we're moving to the IPPs mm -hmm. and we're trying to actually incentivize entrepreneurs to get into those spaces. Because I think only through that will you actually get some of the new and more innovative technologies coming through and being adopted by the, <clears throat> by the early adopters. No, for sure. And of course, there is quite a uh, big and a strong interest in the IPP space from a private investors, not only here in South Africa, but also on the continent. But of course, uh, the African Development Bank can't uh, fund all uh, budding uh, entrepreneurs who are looking to invest further in this critical space that's needed to advance growth. So, so perhaps you can speak to us about other funding models that have been used by other countries uh, to, to, to address the funding gap. I understand that Angola has got a, quite an interesting funding model going on. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that and whether it can be replicated in other countries. Right. Okay, so, so Angola's model is uh, primarily a trade arrangement with China. Uh, so it's an infrastructure for mineral resources bargain. Uh, and some, some studies have shown that this can be an effective model for uh, bridging the infrastructure gap, for particularly for resource-rich uh, countries. However, it is very important to, to manage uh, the governance issues uh, around these arrangements. And as long as the trade arrangements are, are transparent and above board, uh, uh, we believe that it can be, uh, it can be a good source of uh, meeting the infrastructure uh, deficit in some of these countries. Well, at this point, I would like to uh, hit a pause on the conversation that we're having on stage and invite our audience members just to engage with some of the things that they've heard. I do see a hand there. So as we just wait for the mic to come to you, and there's another hand uh, behind him, the, the gentleman in the very beautiful African uh, suit, and there's one there. So if we can just take this gentleman there first. Yeah, my, my question is to the panel is, uh, after the establishment of forum of uh, China Africa relations since 2000, China has a huge investment in infrastructure in different countries of Africa. So, with this investment, what kind of uh, change in value chain is being observed? It is beyond the infrastructure, or some kind of knowledge spillover is going to happen. All right. 
And the gentleman in the, uh, the African suit. Thank you, Chairperson. I think mine, uh, again, thank you for the panelists. As an African young person, uh, just to pose a question, uh, we just uh, received a lot of uh, inputs from, from the panelists about how uh, the economic growth in the country, in the countries, and the well industrialization will actually assist economic growth. But I think I'm coming from a point of concern as a young person in this continent that we have since independence uh, been led by revolutionaries who have actually tend to be the most uh, corrupt uh, political leaders uh, in this world. South Africa is not uh, different to that. We've just seen now World Bank reports actually uh, attesting to the fact that South Africa, uh, in this whole uh, earth uh, world, we are the number one most unequal society. Uh, that doesn't only talk to the income equality gap, but also it takes to the element of exclusion. So if we talk about this industrialization and the economic growth, who is it going to benefit if we have this unaccountable uh, political leadership that is actually leading us? And as well as uh, a civil society that has not actually done anything better, but they've actually supported the looting of their principles. So if we talk about economic growth in this continent, who is it going to benefit? Thank you. Um, shall we take just one more, the gentleman in the uh, yellow tie, um, or the gentleman there. Could I just ask, sir, could you please stand uh, for us and just introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, and then you can uh, pose your question. Thank you, ma'am. I'm not a politician. <coughs> <laughs> I'm from uh, University of South Africa. My name is Professor Godwin. I'm, I had a lot of notes that I wrote here. Maybe some of them I'll, I'll pass on to Aissa and the organizers later on. I just want to start by thanking the panel there in terms of what they've raised. Naturally, I don't raise questions. Um, the starting point for me is revisiting our industrial uh, uh, policies in, on the continent. Uh, as far as those that I've read, especially from East Africa, they are basically main, mainly uh, foreign trade policies. So there's no, there's no deliberate focus in terms of our industrial policies nationally to make sure that at least we address number one, the, uh, the new dawn of African Renaissance and also free trade area. And secondly, the issue of mainstreaming our, our trade within our, 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 our borders and also within the continent. So what I'm effectively saying there is, we have developed policies that promote the idea of importing something from outside the continent and the policies that also diminish the value of the products that we produce as Africans. I, I, I'm yet to see who of us does not want to import things from outside the continent. So basically I'm saying that we need to actually to revolutionize even the consumers on the continent to know that if you're going to grow the continent, then we need to consume locally and have this idea of buying local as our, in our DNA. Then the other issue that is emerging, which is quite interesting, is what do we have in our hands? That is the biggest question. If you're going to be industrializing, you need to know what is that you have on, at, at, at your disposal. Yes, what I think we have at our disposal. We've got the people. This one, we can't debate. We've got people here on the continent. So in terms of human capacity, we have. Then we have got the land and agriculture. This we cannot argue. We have. This we have. So I'm saying there, these are actually development beds that we need to start working on. We have the mineral resources. This we can't debate. We have. Then, of course, we've got the wildlife. I've just mentioned some of the sectors that I think are going to drive our industrial policy. Of course, we've got renewable energy. We have. So we are saying that as we are going to be moving forward, if we cannot address what we have as our bargaining position, then it's going to be difficult. You start running to Africa Development Bank, which operates like any other bank, sorry, sir. I don't really believe in approaching development banks because they all operate within the same protocol. And that protocol is to impoverish whoever is coming to them. So these are some of the things that we need as Africans to put on the table. There's no business for our governments going to development banks. Because you go to World Bank, you go to African Development Bank, by the time you're coming back there, we are six to ten times poorer as a country. So we are saying there, you need to start talking what you call domestic mobilization of resources. That does not require a bank. It simply requires politicians and professionals that can see the vision of where we want to go. We have resources that are being wasted. Corruption has been mentioned. We have, I, I, I think it's about time we start removing politicians 
from the system of governance so that we can have professionals running our governments, running our governments like a private entity where there's accountability. There's a lot of noise in the media now. For People sure. don't, politicians don't want to account. So why are we as a continent For continuing sure. to move on a platform where we are bringing politicians that don't want to account? So I'm saying those right. are some so of the things that we need to address me. moving sure. forward in a proper way. What is it so if you can just allow me to jump in yes, there, I think, um, no, just if you just, um, we'll have a second round of questions yes. and you can have it now. There are yes. other people I'm, I'm who I'm want uh, to I'm ask I'm questions, I'm so I'm please I'm just be patient yes. with me. Uh, you have had your opportunity to ask. There will be a second round of okay, questions. Please fine. take your seat. Thank you so much, you. sir. Thank you. And perhaps we'll kick off with the points that you were making uh, there, uh, particularly one that I agree with you is uh, so some of these uh, uh, trade deals that African countries have found themselves in with the rest of of the world. There's been a lot of uh, criticism to say that they're unfairly skewed and it's not in Africa's uh, favor. Uh, Dr. Kodjo, perhaps you can uh, speak more towards that and uh, the uh, very important point of mobilizing domestic resources a lot more. Yes, I think uh, that observation is it's, it's quite accurate that there is inconsistencies between our trade policies and our industrial policies if there is this at all. If you take the mining sector, for example, some of the, what is commonly referred to as bilateral investment agreements or treaties between African countries and bilateral you know, partners, often tends to um, sort of undermine the very ambitions of our industrial policy. For example, the, the whole issue of local content. Local content is an instrument, is a policy instrument that governments use to stimulate uh, local industrialization, if you like, by requiring that an investor has to utilize local skills, local inputs, uh, local supply chains, and all of that. Oftentimes, the same governments that are seeking to promote this agenda, which is uh, the upstream in the mining sector, is part of the backward linkages, at the same time sign these treaties which forbid them from implementing local content policies that will enhance the inputs or the sourcing of local inputs locally. So that's a contradiction. So I entirely agree. But I think now, I think things are beginning to change. Governments are now aligning or reconciling these discrepancies between treaties, uh, whether it's bilateral or multilateral. The WTO has similar rules that if you're a member of a WTO, you cannot enforce certain uh, requirements when an investor comes in. But I think we are beginning to identify these inconsistencies and, and trying to reconcile them. But also, I think more importantly, the, uh, the African free trade area will, will contribute mm -hmm. to resolving some of these things. We all know that intra-African trade has more value-added components than Africa's trade with the rest of the world. So that in itself tells us something, that Africans seek to gain more by trading with each other in a free trade area than perhaps with the rest of the world. So the paradigm is shifting uh, in the context of, again, uh, using the backward linkage to, to industrialize, the opportunities are there. The issue has been scale. How do you produce at a scale that is competitive, price-wise, and so on? But if you have a free trade area, whether it's regionally or continentally, ultimately leads to economies of scale that will help you to optimize in terms of your competitiveness. So these things are changing, but essentially that has been one of the constraints, that we do have inconsistencies between our trade policies and our industrial policies. Now, very quickly on the issue of corruption, political elites, and the whole uh, uh, accountability deficit on the continent, of course, it does exist, but there are factors. Some of these are also linked with the lack of industrialization. I think there's a clear correlation between the degree of industrialization and the degree of societal consciousness to be able to serve as a counter check to some of these uh, accountability deficits. And I think ultimately, as Africans industrialize, as a civic consciousness and citizenship rights are enhanced, there are institutional mechanisms that can be 
uh, sort of instituted to be able to mitigate some of these corruption behavior that we have. Doctor, Whether you or just not... allow me to jump in <laughs> there. Uh, let me just pause you there for a moment. I mean, Prof. Mike, I'd like you to uh, perhaps also uh, speak more <laughs> to the uh, young gentleman's uh, question there, particularly about the role of uh, young people. Maybe speak more towards the opportunities that young people can exploit in, in, in this industrialization narrative. Um, as, a, as part of an older generation who struggled to bring about a free South Africa, we all need to apologize to the youth. Actually, it's a disgrace, complete disgrace what's happened in terms of education in this country. We, the reason why is that without education, actually nothing can happen. I mean, it's a disgrace that South Africa's education system is lower than Zimbabwe's, let alone all the stuff they've gone through. You know, I mean, and without education, without building skills, South Africa cannot escape from this problem of how to create jobs. There's no point in putting people through school and then pushing them up, and then they leave school, and then actually they're just uneducated. And then you get very pleased with yourself as the Minister of Education and look at our pass rate, and the people are unemployable because actually they don't have the skills to do anything. It's a complete and utter disgrace. And until we tackle that question in South Africa, we will have completely failed um, a generation. But we will have done more, we will actually have destroyed the foundation of, of how you deal with uh, industrialization. You cannot escape globalization. You cannot escape imports. And the only way to counter this and to deal with this is to, to develop the capabilities and the skill base of your own manufacturing and industrial cap um, um, capacity. If you don't do that, you can't actually deal with this, this particular question, and you will always have cheaper imports and better imports. And that's a particular problem. And you can say, buy South Africa as much as you like, but if the stuff that's produced in your country is shit, then basically people are not stupid. They're not going to buy it. Mm -hmm. So we, I come back to this question all the time. If you want proper industrial policy, you have to have alignment mm -hmm. with your education system, with your your science and technology system, with your higher education system, and with your basic um, education system. And your vision has to be build capabilities, build value added, build capabilities, um, build skills. And that's the thrust, the thrust of it. I, I have no other answer to you, my, my, my friend. I'm sorry, Kavane. That's all I can say. And I do know that uh, a lot of the uh, speakers here would also like to weigh in, in on some of the issues that were raised. I would ask that perhaps you save that uh, for your uh, closing comments. But we're going to open up for one round of questions. There was a gentleman here in the front. Could we just get a mic? Okay, so there's a mic there currently. Well, that's fine. Um, can we... Uh, right. It's quite a number. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's begin with you. Yeah, I've attended this conference for eight years. <laughs> Every year I have been attending, and this year I didn't want to attend it, but I, I, I came because I'm too busy, to be honest with you. There's so many things to do, <laughs> so many students to graduate. We're glad you came. Yes, very, yeah, I'm a professor. I, I hold a Sarchi chair here in South Africa, and I came to South Africa from my heart to change South Africa, but I'm struggling, struggling, to be honest with you. Let me just ask you one question. How come when the, in Kigali, we had the continental free trade, why did Nigeria and South Africa refuse to sign? Can I just say just a few things? This is the richest continent in this planet. We have everything. Our people, all of you, could be millionaires, trust me. If Africans learn to own Africa, let me give you another concrete example. When Gaddafi was there, he wanted to create the Afro, like the Euro. He collected enough gold, enough gold, honestly, to create, to remove the World Bank, to remove IMF, to create an Africa. Who, who opposed him is not just Sarkozy. Here too. The people did not support him. The leaders of Africa didn't support him. Can I just say, very, very important, six times more resources every year goes out of Africa. Africa donates to the world. We're not donated. According to Thabo Mbeke's panel in illicit financial flows, 50 billion every year goes out of Africa. We are stolen. 
we are losing. We have everything. We have enough solar energy to give electricity not only to ourselves, to all of Europe. We are rich. How come we are poor? I'm telling you, before you talk about your industrialization, your policy and all this crap, the necessary condition is read a book written by a white man from Canada, The Betrayal, Africa Betrayed. Mm. Please read that. Thank all you, of sir. You. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And uh, the thing is, uh, we do a broadcast to 48 countries, including uh, Nigeria, obviously here in South Africa. So the question that you asked about us not signing that deal, I do understand that negotiations and there's still backroom talks that are still underway. So hopefully we'll get a, a way forward on that soon. So we've got about five minutes. Um, the gentleman in the, okay, we've got a mic there. Can I get a, can I get a question from uh, some of the ladies in the room? Yes, thank you. So, um, no, we'll have, you have you, sir. And then after it's, right, and then you straight after. And then we'll just wrap up for this section. This is uh, Gideon Jaleta. I am from Center of Excellency International Consult from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to unpack the dynamics between IFF and corruption. Corruption mainly involves from the public side, government officials. But when you talk about IFF, it's mainly from the companies because I was involved in the IFF study at UNECA. It's mainly this the IFF is because of just from one element that is trade mispricing, which is happening because of the, what the companies are doing, mining companies are doing in Africa. And as Professor Muche said, $50 billion is lost every year and $1 billion every day, every week. That's very huge. So it's important to address this deficiency in the mineral sector. The other is there is also lack of transparency and accountability in the sector. Mm. So this demands good governance of the value chain. Mm. Not only good governance in its generic sense, but good governance starting from contract negotiation is very much important for African countries. And also the, the regimes, the mineral regimes that African countries have are, are, are very obsolete. These are the regimes that were developed in 1970s and 80s, which are not, you know, wh why the mineral sector per se? The mineral sector must be integrated with the rest of the economy. So such dynamics must be uh, captured. And the, my final point is that it's also important to introduce the PPPs, the public-private uh, partnership in, for the sector, rather than just the state as an important player, and also including the locals, uh, you know, in whatever projects developed in the sector, rather than evicting them and giving to investors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those points that you have made. Um, I'd just like to... That's, that's fine. So you... Yes, so you said that is fine. You'll have your question in just a moment. Um, I'd just like to say that we are going to be wrapping up the official live broadcast. Um, but what will happen as soon as we uh, sign off is uh, that we will continue with the question and answer session. So at this uh, stage, I'd like to thank uh, the viewers who have uh, been watching. Uh, thank you so much for engaging with us in this very critical conversation as we speak about accelerating industrialization on uh, the continent further to uh, certainly uh, develop the continent's uh, uh, objectives being to reduce poverty, to reduce inequality, and to create more uh, jobs. Uh, from those watching on CNBC Africa uh, channel uh, 4 at uh, 10, uh, this is the official uh, sign off. But to our Facebook viewers, we will still be engaging with you, and we do encourage you to still engage with us on Facebook. Make use of those hashtags being AUR2018 and hashtag Africa Day Exp uh, Expo 2018 from us. Here at St. George in Pretoria, it is bye for now.